Mr. Madan is an investor who doesn't share the common investing beliefs and is always looking out to convert simple ideas into valuable investment opportunities. From his extensive research in the field of capital markets, he has collated some interesting facts about the Indian market in a Q&A format, which will help us understand the business trends, past business trends, and the so-called 100 bagger opportunities. So ladies and gentlemen, get ready for an interactive session as I welcome Mr. Maran on behalf of the CFA India Society. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jitendra. Uh, thanks to him. Had this you know, I had this opportunity to present to you. This is uh, not the first time I'm making this presentation. Land few, but in very different forums. Um, my job doesn't require any active engagement with uh, forums, so I don't make any business presentations. But this is something which we have been doing now for almost a year. After I read a book, it's called Factfulness. Bill Gates, uh, the foreword, wrote that uh, this is one must-read book that everyone should read. And he said, this is one book which uh, changed the way billions of dollars of philanthropy changed its course. So I read that book. There were a few questions in that book which I tried to answer. And before I started answering questions, I thought I know a little about India and the world. If you are managing 5,000 crores, it is expected that you should know a few things. But when I did those questions, uh, um, it was a little shameful, I didn't know many. And then I collated equivalent questions in Indian context, which I knew. Then I went around and asked my friends, my college group. And then one fine day I asked my only sons. And most occasions, um, the answers we got and the actual had a lot of gaps. So that's how this presentation evolved, not as an exercise to test your knowledge level, not to test how much you know, but uh, many times we create perceptions based on the data points our mind has stored, right? And this exercise is just to test what kind of data points that we have stored in our mind. Um, I come from Chennai, there is a joke that uh, why the Jinigan movies are always houseful is each person buys two tickets, one for him, one for his mind. So you love his movies if you don't think too much. So what I suggest, there are a few empty chairs. Keep your mind there. And look at that, how much it stores. So in the next couple of minutes, my colleagues will come and leave a sheet with each one of you. We'll do this exercise. right? Be honest to yourself. Pick an answer which your mind throws immediately after going through the question. Don't think. I am not going to correct back the answer sheets, so you don't have to feel happy and embarrassed. Be true to yourself. Just pick an answer. Um, hush, we can circle it. Just leave 5-6 copies each table 
and they can share it among themselves. Many of us may not know this economist, uh, she is a British economist. Many of her students have got Nobel Prize, one, one is from India, Amartya Sen. She is her professor. She also advised uh, uh, many emerging countries, governments, and many things she said were wrong. But this one statement she said is beautiful. And it's right, right? Whatever you say about India, the opposite is also equally true. India is a poor country, it's also a rich country. Whatever you say about India, I can argue why the opposite is also. Because we are a country of 20 plus states, 30 plus languages, uh, caste, creed, religion. But one thing is uniform, like Ms. Lakshmi Ayer highlighted. Um, we are notorious for being negative, right? That's not something new. Um, this is, uh, I had the privilege to um, get to know Dr. Abdul Kalam. In fact, when we launched one fund in his memory, we named the fund itself as APJ20. On the day he passed away, uh, we had the opportunity to engage with him in the afternoon. He passed away at 7 o'clock in the evening and 12 to 2. But one thing which was evident uh, in his last few years is this. He narrated a story that, uh, that uh, once he had been to Tel Aviv, Israel. And there were just on the day he arrived, there was bomb loss. Hamas planted some bomb, which lasted. Lives were lost. And he reached safely the hotel. And next day morning, he woke up, had his coffee and his reading newspapers. And the front page of the newspaper had no coverage of the bomb blast. And he was surprised. Then he checked whether it was actually a today's newspaper. The front page was about um, how an orchard in the desert uh, had a new uh, agricultural technology, drip irrigation kind of technology, um, which is a pot baking discovery. And the news about bomb came fourth, fifth page somewhere inside. He said, had this happened in India, the whole newspaper would have been full of only the bomb blast. So he narrated this just to drive a point, what's wrong with us, you know, why are we so negative? There are few things which actually attracts our attention to the negativity, but there are many things around us which are doing well, have been growing. Why don't we take notice of it, right? So with that, I uh, will start this exercise. Each one have the question papers with you? Okay. So what we will do is format of this presentation quickly, 5 to 8 minutes, I will run through a few questions. There will be about 20, 25. And I have no clue what combination of these questions. We had collated um, several questions um, and in each forum, we do different combinations. So many of these questions may not be nothing, it may not be anything to do with economy or finance or market or anything, right? Which city of the following has one of the top 20 busiest airport in the world? Just pick an answer which comes top of your mind. Singapore, New York, Delhi. Done? Which is the busiest airport? What is India's 
youth literacy rate youth meaning people aged below 24 what is the literacy rate how many of them are literate 55 then choose a with 74 choose b with 92 choose c done question 3 which is the second largest indian state by gdp terms of course we know maharashtra is the largest state in gdp thanks to bombay which is the second gujarat tamil nadu or karnataka done we are now our gdp major portion 60% is coming from services 15 is only coming from agriculture how much of our population is actually dependent on these three segments of gdp agriculture industry services is it uh, 45% of our population agriculture 60% or 25% okay question number 5 the total fertility rate as you know if husband wife wife delivers two babies the replacement rate is 2 it is just replacement rate uh, leaving some room for infant mortality child mortality 2.1 globally is considered the replacement rate when we got independence in 1947 our fertility rate in india was about 6 what is it now is it 4 3 or 2 question 6 these are all animals which are considered almost extinct endangered animals as per human tiger asiatic lion one horned rhinoceros all these numbers in india in the last 10 years have doubled or declined or the same pick a number you can a b c whatever your mind says is most logical one a life expectancy rate currently is close to 68 what was it when we got independence our elders did they live up to 75 or 50 or 30 the average life expectancy of india as you know world economic forum each year does uh, gdp estimates based on past trends current events so they rated the uh, cities and the top 10 cities in the world in terms of gdp growth how many of them are from india is it 3 7 or 10 question number 9 As you know every 10 years we do census from 1951 2001 to 2011 the 2001 census we had we crossed 100 crore population this is the first time indian population crossed 100 crores the time there were almost about 41 crore children 40.7 children meaning aged below 14 Today we have 137 crore. This year, 135 years of last year beginning. How many children are there in India today? How many of us aged below 14 in India? There are six countries in the world which have more land mass than us. right we are seventh largest country in terms of land mass that's not going to change but what is our rank 
globally in the agriculture production. We are seventh largest or seventeenth largest or second. What do you think is India's rank? What your mind has already stored as a data point based on which we create perceptions? India has eighteenth largest coastline in the world. There are there are seventeen countries which have bigger coastline than us. What is our rank in global fisheries output? 18, 28, 2. Question number 12. What's our rank in global steel production? Global cement production? Global power generation? Are we fifth largest steel maker, tenth largest cement maker, fifteenth largest power producer? In that case, choose A. Question number 13. There are 2,700 billionaires in the world today. Depending on the dollar rate movement, that number could be 100 higher, 100 lower. What is India's rank in the list of countries with billionaires. There are 141 countries billionaires were born and only 121 countries today in the world where billionaires live. What is our rank? We all know oil is super sensitive commodity because that's the most important line item in India, which is the second largest one. Is it coal or gold or electronics? Question number 15. We all often hear about shootings, right, in US. Gun population in US is more than human population. US has the 34 crore population but 40 crore guns. What is our rank globally in the list of countries with guns? Total number of guns each country wise. Out of 141 countries with a gun policy, private gun policy, what's our rank? Absolute number of guns, not per capita. We exclude the guns police army have, private guns, guns that you and me have. Actually, I don't have. Question number 16. The earth's greening, that is the surface covered by leaves or trees, has actually not declined in the last 20 years, which itself uh, people disagree, but there are few countries which have contributed to this. Is it India, China, or Europe, Brazil, or USA, Canada? Which combination of countries have helped green, have helped the earth becoming greener? More greener than what it was 20 years back. Though India's agricultural production has grown, reaching them to the target market, we all have a lot of shortcomings like storage, distribution. There are 189 countries globally with the cold storage capacity. Even small African countries have it. What is our rank in global Cold storage capacity. Shall I move on? Question number 18. Each household in India, average household, is about 
which means there are about five people in a household in India today. So if you have 135-136 crore population, there are 27 crore households. The last uh, official data of per capita income of India, which you often hear in, in various industry forums, investment pitches, is 1.2 lakhs per capita income of India. If on an average uh, there are five people in a household, how many households actually have an income of 6 lakhs or above? 25 million households, 45 million, 85 million, out of 270 million households in India. Often we hear about middle class consumption which is actually driving our economy. Close to 60% of GDP is triggered from this so-called middle class, right? I will show you three pictures. Where is middle class of India? Which picture middle class? What is middle class? At least households which earn 3 lakhs to 12 lakhs. So, if you put all the households in India, 0 to 100, 100 being richest class, 0 being the poorest class, where do you think middle class of India is? A, B or C? Next question. Domestic jewelry purchase, gold, that we all buy, we pay cash, buy the jewelry. India as a country imports them. Between 2005 and 15, just in 10 years, our household spent $250 billion just buying gold. FIAs were allowed in 1992. And we, till date, how much you think totally FIAs have invested? Each year, every year, since they were allowed, till date, all FIAs put together. Is it 1000 billion, 500 billion, 200 billion? This is considered the most um, reformist budget, right? India's liberalization started from 1991. In that budget, corporate taxes were raised or cut remain the same. What our mind says is the logical answer, just beat that. Even the previous speaker, let me add, talked about how our direct tax revenue is low, even worse than Ethiopia, right? How much actually it was? Between 11 to 12 lakh crores. Government expected 12, but we came close to that. 12 lakh crores. What is our GDP? 2.6 trillion dollars. When we began liberalization, our GDP was one tenth of what we are today. One tenth. We have grown ten times. No country except one have grown ten times in such a short period, especially with this kind of population. But what was our direct tax collection? In 91. Which city of the following had more office space leased last year? Bangalore, Shanghai, Beijing, London, Paris. Globally, the expect income is the highest in which of the following cities? Mumbai, New York, 
और हांगकांग Many of you may not know, in Dow Jones top 30 American corporations, there are only two companies, there is a shareholder holding 10% or above. There is no concept of promoter holding there. Okay. India out of these 30 census companies, how many companies have 50% promoter stake? Let's say 40 is a number. How many companies? How many out of 30 companies promoter stake is 40, 50, no. India is the only country where the regulator has to have a regulation to bring down promoter stake. Okay. 25 questions. Next question you may not find in your, you just need a, to pick a number. We will come back and revisit that. Just pick a number. Whatever that comes in your mind. Out of 0 to 100. Okay. The winner among you is he or she who picked the number which is two third of the number which the average of everyone has picked. Let us say three of you, 20, 30, 40, add up you get 90 divided by 3, 30, average is 30. So two third of that 30 is 20. So if there are three people who choose 20, 30, 40, he or she who choose 20 is the winner. The winner is someone who choose two third of the average of the number which everyone chosen. Any number between 0 to 100, just write down that number in your paper, we will come back. Done? There are many people staring on feeling thinking. I just said your mind should not be in your head now. Right? Okay. What is the answer? First question. Daddy. But some of it, uh, is it not hard for us to accept that Delhi airport is more busier than Singapore? Busier than New York? JFK handles less passengers than Delhi Airport. We ha Delhi Airport handled 69 million passengers last year. Okay. Ten years back, Delhi was nowhere in the list. It's not in top 10, not in top 20, not in top 30. So what has changed? Then. Where is Bombay? Bombay is not there in the list. Even now. You know why? Because Bombay has only one runway. But Bombay has a record. It's world's most busiest airport with one runway. Right? Uh, about a month back, on one day, they handled 1046 takeoffs landings in one day. Just close your eye, think for a minute. 1046 takeoffs landings a day. During a day. Between 4 pm to 11 pm that, that, that day, they handled two takeoffs, one landing, or two landing, one takeoff every minute. What a coordination you have to have, right? The accident levels are zero. And when people badmouth us that we are poor in coordination, we don't talk to each other, we agree. But there are places where the coordination levels are perfect. The child school enrollment rate is 96. See, in a country where the literacy rate, what was the literacy rate when we got independence? 14. What was women literacy rate in 1947? 8. 
eight out of hundred people in India could read write. Right? We glorify British so much, but that's the state they left us. What is the state they left us? One out of seven Indians could read write men, and one out of thirteen women could read write. Now, it takes 30, 40, 50 years to, for the literacy rate to catch up. Right? Maybe 20 years later, you will find the literacy rate coming closer to 95 or global average. Because you still have those people who never went to, they were illiterate when they were 10, 20 years old. And now they are 60, 70, they will be still illiterate only. Third question, most obvious answer we get is Gujarat. Tamil How can we go wrong in second largest state? Actually speaking, Tamil Nadu has no great industry like Gujarat and no great services sector like Karnataka. But Tamil Nadu invested in education. If you take the engineering colleges, medical colleges, or rather for that, for that matter, colleges opened in India, 60s, 70s. We had 7% of India's population and 23% of the colleges opened. Not one day today, not one year to year, 15 years in a row. Our child enrollment rate in school in 1970s, not one year to year, for 15 years in a row was the highest in the country. We were the first state to reach several districts, 100% literate. When? 1993. So if you have literacy rates high, you will have um, less children, you have much higher life expectancy rate, productive population age group of 15 to 65, which is the driver of GDP. We somehow get a feeling that industry is GDP. Industry is not. Industry is small. What is Sensex and Nifty and stock market and economy are two different things. Okay? For example, if you take Sensex or Nifty today, which is what we refer to to judge how markets are doing and therefore judge what the economy is doing. 39% of Sensex, 36% of Nifty are banking and financial stocks, which was 85% of the discussion the previous speaker engaged with. But what was it as a percentage of GDP? What is financial services a percentage of Indian GDP? Six point two percent. That's it. If financial services do badly, Sensex, Nifty will do badly. The economy may not have to. But what was construction as a percentage of GDP? 8.5%. As a percentage of Sensex, not even 2. So if construction do badly, the economy will suffer. Index may not have to. Right? There are two different things. They will move two different things. GDP derives 15% agriculture, 25% industry, 60% services in Indian GDP. But what proportion of the population is dependent on these three? First, 45% is agriculture. That's the right answer. This answer you will get different answers in different time periods. For example, when we got independence, 1947. It's Ulta. 60% of GDP is agriculture. Services was 15. Industry was 24. Those 1947, the service industry is what? Public administration, government staff, military, defense, postal, insurance companies, only there. Right? But 60% of Indian GDP was agriculture, which is why we were all taught India is an agrarian country. There's no more. 83% of India is non-agrarian, actually. 
today. But the problem is when we got independence, when we, it was 60% of GDP, 76% of population was dependent on India, which is why Mahatma Gandhi said India actually lives in rural. And it is no more true. What proportion of population is agriculture? 45. But 60% share has come down to 15%. But 76% population has come down only to 45. So the problem in agriculture is not in denominator. It is in denominator. You can't have 15% line item taking half the population. Right? People do per capita, right? Per capita income, $2,000, $1.2 lakhs, $1.4 lakhs. But that's not per capita here because 60% of GDP is what? 2.6, 60%, 1.6 trillion. Only 28% of the population is services. What is the population? 136 crore, 28% 40 crore. So 40 crore people get 1.6 trillion. Where is the average there? $4,000 plus. And what is the average for this 45% of the population which is in 15%? $700. So you have $700 per capita in agriculture, you have $4,000 plus dollars per capita in services and you combine that saying that it is $2,000 average. It is not. Total fertility rate in India is 2.2 and south is 1.7. And the state where I come from, Tamil Nadu, is breaching one and a half this year. They're coming close to European standards. So before we began, this was one of the discussions with Jitendra saying that, you know, where are the children? He said average age of the participants is 30, 35. Now, your age. And he said this is a young crowd. He said, if you are 30 in Delhi, you are not young. If you are 24 in Delhi, you are older than the other average. If you are 36 in Chennai, you are younger than the average. If you are 22 in Uttar Pradesh, you are older than the average. If you are 40 in Coimbatore, you are little younger than the average. This is India. So, any statistics you generalize, India is a young country, but not in South. What is fertility rate in Tamil Nadu? One and a half. But what is the death rate in Tamil Nadu? People don't die. Yeah. You know the life expectancy rate in Tamil Nadu? 83. So we took this actual sensical number. Um, we are about 136 crore population and 7.5 crore Tamil Nadu, 3.5 crore Kerala. So Tamil Nadu and Kerala is about 11 crores, which is about 8% of India's population. Take all the elders aged above 70 in India. All the elders aged is about T in India. So 8% of population is in one area, where close to 20% of elders of India are in that area. We actually contribute to the elders because the demographic dividend, we all enjoyed for the last 25 years. Less population. So there is one uh, study, it's still working progress for us. So what we are taking, we are taking all the 534 MP seats, each district within each MP seats. And look at three data points. Um, women education, okay, um, household income, and number of children trained per women. There's a perfect, not 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, perfect one to one correlation there. So, when one of the political leaders, who's the most powerful man, probably the second most powerful man, was in uh, election speech blamed one religion for the population growth saying uh, their portion of the total population is X number but their proportion of the total population in India has grown 
1.5x, 1.8x, uh, we refuted that. In, not in public forum, I don't have the guts. But we refuted that in our circle, saying that there is nothing to do with population, there is nothing to do with religion. If you take that one religion, the average child per woman in Bombay is less than the child per woman of Bombay. If you take uh, the average child per woman of that religion in Kerala, is less than the average majority religion's child per woman in Uttar Pradesh. So it's nothing to do with religion. If you educate women, child per woman declines. Number one. Number two, if mortality rate declines, child per woman declines. It's, it's like basic economics. If your child mortality rate is 195 per thousand, which is what India was when we got independence and remained so for many years. Just think, out of thousand children born in India, 195 died before the age of five. So as a mother, she is not sure whether the one kid she is going to have is going to survive. If you tell her that the child mortality rate is 10 per thousand, then she will be more confident that the child she delivers is, is going to live longer. Second, when your agriculture is 60%, when your GDP is 60% agriculture, which is labor intensive, children are considered assets. It's like a additional labor, which is not so today. So, probably the already, I say, India as a whole population growth rate, which if you take every 10 years, you will find 30-40%. Now it is growing 1.2% here. And it is growing 1.2, major 70% is because of the increase in life expectancy and therefore reduction in death rates. Then new children being born. Which is, which is why number of children in India has actually fallen in the last 20 years. We have less children today than what we had 20 years back. All these animals which are extinct, endangered globally, India are happy to live here. They grow in number. They roam, roam around our country. They are roaming around so much that uh, last month there was a leopard which came to Andheri West. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a newspaper writer. Only guy went to his house and opened the door, there was a tiger sitting inside. So all this population has doubled. And already the three, four out of G20 countries are taking expertise from us in how to take care of wildlife. So we can badmouth so much, but we have a regulatory platform which uh, takes care of uh, the wildlife. What is the life expectancy rate when we got independence? Where have we come from? It's a long journey that we have done last 70 years. You know the average age when previous generations this is often compliance that you no know, lifestyle was great um, 20 years back, 50 years back. Often we crib about that, right? You know the average age of Indians in 1947? 31. Is that the age you die? And what productivity country will have if you are on an average day at the age of 31? So, this is what is called uh, denominator bias. Of the people who didn't die in 31, 32, they lived longer. And we are looking only them. And therefore, we conclude that people, Indians' life was better in 1940s, 50s, 60s. It was worse. And you look at those few older guys born in 1940s, 50s being healthy and conclude that most people who born in 1940, 50 were healthy. They are not. In some forums I put this, where is, they ask where is the option with zero? Right? Top 10 cities GDP growth wise, all the time are Indian cities. 10 out of 10, top 10 city, growing cities by GDP wise are Indian cities. 
But unfortunately, there's only one in north. There's none in east. There is one in Maharashtra. There is one in Gujarat. Actually, two in Gujarat. And three in Tamil Nadu. One in Andhra, one in Telangana, which is today two states, but actually two in Andhra. And there are two in Karnataka. Numbers over. Right. So what is the average rate of cities are growing in South? 11 and a half to 12 and a half. 9, 9 and a half. Anything below 9, we consider this average. This is a number. Average, the number of children living today in India is lower than what it was 20 years back. <laughs> uh, if you come to Chennai, you go to any restaurant, any place, any social place, uh, you won't find any locals working there. So people used to ask, where are all the boys? The answer is, there are no boys there. If you walk in any average uh, city road, you will find most, it's a common sight. You can see mostly 50s, 60s, 70s. You know Durgesh Bhai, right? So I went to see him in Pune and we met in a Starbucks. I usually don't go to Starbucks. Uh, you know why? They ask you your name and write in that uh, cup, right? And usually they write as moron. And, and they, they, they call Mr. Moran, I have to go, <laughs> and each one will turn. <laughs> so this Starbucks, when I met uh, uh, Mr. Shah, he said, uh, see, he, his, his wife is from Coimbatore. And he said, uh, we, should, we could have met at home, but uh, my in-laws have come and it's very noisy. Uh, they all have come from Coimbatore. So, we are meeting in Starbucks. And we were waiting in the queue to pay our bill. And he said, Coimbatore is a great city, it hasn't changed at all. And this meeting is happening in Pune, where he lives. And uh, I told him, what is the difference between Coimbatore and Pune? Why do you think Coimbatore hasn't changed? Which is a fact. If you go Coimbatore, uh, it hasn't changed much in the last 20, 30, 40 years. It's because of this. The average age or the median age of Coimbatore is close to 35 to 40. And it's bordering Kerala where the elders live. And even today, 70, 80 percent of Coimbatore built are with people who are aged 50. And people aged 50 don't like change. Right? If they don't go to the disco, there won't be any disco in Coimbatore. If they often go to temple, there will be a lot of temples there. If they, like, if they don't like apartments, they won't find apartments there. If they believe in living in independent house, you will find a lot of independent houses there. But what is the average age of a home buyer in India? It's a huge number. It's 34. What is that age in Pune? 29. The average age of a home buyer in Pune is the only city in India which it has fallen even below 30. This is the average. Majority of the home buyers in Pune are aged 20. So, recently there was a flood in Kerala, right? A few months back. And many people lost their lives. So we took uh, all the list of people who died and asked the question, how many of them were Malayalis? Flood, Kerala, people died. The impression we get this, most people who died were, should have been locals, Malayalis. But actually two-thirds of the people who died are UP, UP and Bihar. They were there, a slapper. So what about children in Kerala? They don't exist. On an average, the child per day women in Kerala is 1.6, which means over 15 to 20 years, number of children per family has been falling, not growing. And half of them are in Gulf, that's a different matter. <laughs> uh, 
So we are seventh largest country in terms of land mass. Our aggregation yield is below world average. And we are second largest country in the world in terms of agricultural output. How can you have seventh largest capacity and under utilization of capacity and second largest producer of product in the world? Yes, those six countries which are bigger than us, like US, Canada, Brazil, China, Russia, two thirds of the years, two thirds of the land, you can't do agriculture. It's not arable. Here you can do 365 days a year, maybe two, three crops you can do. And our yield is low, but production is high. Yield is low not because of anything, it is very fragmented land ownership. It was not that bad 1950s, 60s when one guy had 10, 20 acres, but he had seven children and that seven children had at least two, three each, so it became 20 and land ownership kept falling down and corporates are not allowed. So when people say we need to double the farm income, how do we do that? If you are already the second largest producer of agriculture products in the world, you are the largest maker of milk in the world, you are second in rice, maybe third in wheat, and the largest in fruits, the largest. So by producing more, there is nothing that you are going to achieve, it is not that you are producing less. We have the 18th largest coastline and we still do manual fishing. We don't do mechanized fishing as much as Europe and America does. What is our rank in global fisheries output? Two. How can you have 18th largest capacity and we still be the second largest guy? Because of manual labor, but significant population dependent on fishing. Fishermen for population, significant in India. No other country has this many fishermen. People at least agree steel, cement, but they disagree in power. Are we third largest producer of power in the world? We are. Are we second largest in steel? Yes. Are we second largest in cement? Of course, yes. When our steel industry was set up, I think it was 1914 Tata Steel, first one. I had the privilege to go to Jamshedpur. There is one um, place where the guys who work there in themselves don't have not, never read that. It's clearly written. It was written by um, the largest steel company of that year, that period. It's a British company. The CEO of that company has given a quote. If Indians can make steel, which, which is what Tata was trying to make. So if Indians, Indians can make steel, I will eat it for breakfast. It's a sarcastic comment he made. Boss, you, you can't make steel. If you make, I will have it for my food, breakfast. And it exactly took 94 years for Tata Steel to acquire this company. Now we are second largest. We beat Japan two years back, which was largest for probably about 53 countries. But you, one thing you will find is, is, is this something which we should be proud of or feel bad about it? We should be proud of as a country and feel bad about it as a shareholder in business. Why? Just take steel, cement, power, 2006 set off. Whatever cement capacity India put 1947 till 2006, we put in the next six years. 
Hmm? What was steel capacity of India in 2007? 142 million. How much of that was capacity utilized? 94%. How much was the profit growth of cement companies between 2002 and the 8, those 6 years? 30% CAGR. What is 30% over 6 years? 450%. So, you made 5 times more than what you made just 6 years back. Great. So, you put more in capacity, depreciation high. Hmm? And your uh, tax burden comes, you still think 94%. But what is the capacity? Installed capacity of cement today, 300 million ton. How much of that is idle? 30 percent. 100 million ton is idle. How long? Last six, seven years. How much it costs to put 1 million ton? Six, 650 crores. 100 million ton idle, 65,000 crores. Whose money? Shareholders money partly and debt money partly. So what is your capacity utilization now? 74 percent. So as a shareholder, let's say we are about 100 of us. Let's say two of us own each Nifty company. There are 50 Nifty companies. Say two of you own each company. And we all decide that we won't put any new capacities. Okay? We won't expand. But India is still growing. Six, seven, maybe five, maybe eight. Demand is growing. And if you don't have increased capacity, more of our existing capacity will get utilized. Which is efficiency gains, right? So, 2002 to 2008, the earnings of Nifty companies went up 27%. What is 27%? Over 6 years, 4 times. But sales of Nifty companies went up only 1.5 times. Because 2002, we were underinvested. Government of India was borrowing 16%. You had September 11 attack, December parliament attack, Southeast Asian financial crisis, Nasdaq crashed, Sensex fell 65%, cost of money for AAA corporates was 18%, no investment capacity. But when India subsequently grew, underinvested, pricing was with capacity owner, margins grew. What was India's corporate margins 2008-9? Uh, 9.4 percent of the sales. What is it last year? We are at 17 year low in terms of profit margins. So between 2009 and 2016, sales of Indian companies grew exactly as much as it grew in the last previous six years. But previous six years earnings went up four times and next six years earnings went up 51 percent. Our margin compression hasn't come from government, geopolitical, global events. It all came because we foolishly went and invested in huge capacity. Who wanted India to double the cement capacity between 2006 and 12? Who wanted us to double steel capacity? And that too, not, steel is not one product. Uh, the segment in steel where we doubled, uh, not the segment, we, on one side, India has excess capacity in steel, on the other side, we also actually import different grade steel. Here, our rank is 3. There are only two countries which have more billionaires than India. Actually, there is one statistics which I uh, could have put here, but uh, okay. Between now and the next five years, if you take countries creating new millionaires, dollar millionaires, those who have less than 7 crores crossing 7 crores limit, how many you think India will create in the next five years? No other country will create million millionaires. Total number of millionaires India has created till date in the last 75 years is 3 lakh. Total number of millionaires we created first 50 years was 60,000. Next 10 years. 1 lakh. Last 2 years, 1 lakh. Oil obviously is the largest net import item, which is the second one. Gold was the second largest line item till 3 years back. 
to do this electronics. Why? Two thirds of India is aged below 34. Half of them are women. Women aged 20, 30, 40 is not buying as much jewelry as she used to buy when at her age in the previous generation. So gold jewelry volume declining last two, three, four years. Nothing to do with gold price. It's a it's a beginning of a very very long term trend. You think uh, women in 20s are going to buy more gold five years later? Of course not. Certainly not as jewelry. Right? Had we known this, we should have bought a 200 bagger. We are in the world of big data, right? Very often we hear the term big data. But many of the multi baggers have come from small data. Just that one small data, if you had understood, you know, where to lead for or where to look for the future returns. And most people put 141 because the impression we have is gun culture in India actually doesn't exist. I have a couple of my colleagues here. Um, we went for a marriage in UP. And we didn't realize that it is a culture there that you should have a gun and fire and they will take a video. Quite scary, right? Can you believe after the US, India has more guns? Shocking. We have 96 lakh gun licenses in India officially, which government accepts, yes. And we have 7.2 crore guns. Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Russia, they all have less than us. I think we are Indians are responsible users of them. Yet surface greening, this is something which took a lot of our time because this is one question people always dispute because they don't agree that earth has become more greener. It does become more greener. NASA has satellite images taken of the same side of Earth in 16 dimensions every month updated for the last 20 years. You don't need to pay anything, you can just visit their site. And many times we get these WhatsApps like NASA data is a fake. But here you can actually visit NASA data. You can take geography wise how the greening has happened. And India's greening has actually grown in the last 20 years. It looks like that we are cutting trees in Bombay and Delhi, but there are significant amount of barren lands in India, which has become agricultural land now, which we don't notice it. So India and China has actually contributed to its greening, but it is being accused. Of course, we are polluting more, that's different. But we are not responsible for uh, lack of greening in the earth. Actually, lack of greening has happened where? In the second category, which is what most people choose as, as added to the green. Brazil loses a lot more green than any other country in the world. We produce second largest uh, agricultural output in terms of rank that we have. Every product you take, we are surplus. The uh, biggest complaint we have is government is not allowing us to export because we are super sensitive on commodity prices. And we also tend to think that our farmers are not getting paid more, which is wrong. Just take, say, for example, um, milk. If you are paying 30, 35 rupees a liter, 72 percent of what you pay as a consumer actually goes to the farmer as procurement bill. Show me one country where the farmer gets 72 percent of what the customer is paying. So we pay farmers well. You take sugar, which is a sensitive product in Uttar Pradesh. What is the sugar price today? If you go to a shop and buy one kilo of sugar, how much you pay? 35 rupees you pay. Right? Sorry? 40. What was it 10 years back? 40. 
what was it 20 years back 40 yeah yeah actually sugar prices have grown you think tobacco prices have grown onion has grown prices have grown but the price being paid to the farmer has grown right what is the minimum support price for sugar cane 20 years back 400 rupees a ton what was it 10 years back 1200 rupees a ton what is it today 2800 rupees a ton if you are a sugar mill owner your end price is the same and your raw material prices have gone up 6 times you will be bankrupt you are not bankrupt you are still life there because of industrial alcohol power co-generation many other stuff if you are a pure sugar guy you are out but it will correct itself it should have corrected itself in, if not for artificial interference from the government right if let's say government had no interference in this either cost of sugar would have gone up or price you pay to grow the cane would have come down or both would have happened it can't remain like this a state like maharashtra should not be producing sugar cane at all on one side you have a state which is drought people who no water to drink right tamil nadu no water to drink then why do you have a sugar cane industry putting personal sugar cane of india from maharashtra and tamil nadu to make 1 kilo of sugar you use 11 liters of water and you export sugar basically you are exporting water and then you spend money in buying water is ridiculous right at some stage it will set in and therefore to answer to this question it is not production it's, is it logistics is it storage what is india's rank in global cold storage capacity people choose 184 because i put 189 if i had put 189 they would have choose 189 but the real answer is one India has more cold storage capacity than any other country in the world. Then what is the problem with agriculture? Production is not a problem. Storage is not a problem. Logistics is also not a problem. So 270 million households totally in India averaging 5 per household adding up to 136 crore per capita income 1.2 lakhs which adds up to something like 6 lakhs to an outsider it will look like on an average Indian households you know, 6 lakhs but actually how many households in India you know, 6 lakhs how many are average how many below average how many above average because that should be the average no if you put let's say one Mukesh Ambani inside this room and then calculate what is the average wealth does it mean anything to you or me he will tilt the average dramatically, right? Which is why any consumption item when you take, people will say per capita consumption of this in China is so much in US, so much in India this much. Very low. It should grow. And it is not growing. I, I must have heard that argument hundred times, right? When a company comes with an IPO, they say that this product per capita, look at global, look at uh, emerging market, look at India. India is even lower than Africa. The problem is not that our per capita consumption of these materials are low. It is because they are all taking whole of Indian population as India's per capita consumption market. It is not. So, if you take 270 million households, the only 45 million households which are at average or above average. Can you believe it? So, what is India's population? If anyone asks outside India, India has 45 million households, that's all. If you are an industry, if you are a product, you are serving consumption side, India is not 27 crore households, 5 people each, 135 crore population country. You are a 4.5 crore household, 18 crore India population. That's all is the market. 
which leads to this question. They often use this middle class, middle class. Where is it? How middle is middle class? This is something which uh, um, MasterCard did a study. It costed them. They didn't realize it will cost them so much. Otherwise, they would not agree. So they did this study, which is now a free document. Anyone uh, can Google it, download it. It's most interesting 23-page research I ever read. It's authored by Rama Bijapurkar on ICE, Indian Consumer Environment. And this is stolen from her work. Um, so A, B, C, where is India's middle class? Is actually B. India's middle class is 78th percentile to 96th percentile. That's it. Anything below 78th percentile is poor. Is not a consumer. It is not. So what we think is rich India is actually middle India. The rich India is only 96th percentile to 100th percentile. So it looks shocking. But what is this 78th percentile to 96th percentile, which is 18% of households? What is 18% of households? Close to 50 million, right? How many countries in the, how, in the world have such a large consumer market? Even though that is only 18% of India. It's a huge market. This market, if If 60 to 75 come in here, we'll grow 8.5 to 9 percent in GDP. Our transition to 5 trillion, if you take 8 percent, it will take 9 years. If you take 6 percent, it will take 11 years. Whether it is 8 years, 11 years, it doesn't matter. It will eventually reach. That has nothing to do with US, China, global events, nothing. What percentage of GDP growth has actually come from exports? Okay, what percentage of current GDP is exports? It's simple, not take exports divided by GDP, what is it? 14, 15%? 81% of India is domestic. 3% is deemed exports, which is again domestic. So why are we getting concerned about global environment? Because 56% of census companies' revenues are global. But that is not India. India is only 15% sensitive to global events. There are many households uh, who feel bad when Deepika Padukone gets a headache or she is not well. Boss, let's worry about our headaches, yeah. So let's not worry too much about global event. I read a letter to a Chief Investment Officer of a Mutual Fund, 2014. Um, his annual letter to his investors had 1,474 words. I counted. Out of that, 800 words were about Greece, Spain, Portugal. And 600, 450, 600 words were about India economy, election which is going to come. Not even 100 words about earnings of the companies. If you are an equity owner, over a long period of time, all you make is what the company that you hold makes, which means you pick any company, any stock, small cap, mid cap, large cap, and ask yourself how much you made in the last 10, 20, 30 years as a shareholder in those companies. And go back and check those companies' actual earnings growth. Both will match to the second decimal point if the time period you have taken is longer. Right? So if there is a global event which is going to impact the earnings of the company, you should be concerned. Like if I am an Infosys shareholder or evaluating to buy Infosys, then I should be concerned about US economy slowdown, banking stocks, technology spend of banking stocks. But if I am going to evaluate whether I should buy TTK prestige or not, then why do I worry about US economy and technology spend of US banks? And more than 60% of drivers in GDP are TDK prestige kind of drivers, not Infosys drivers. 
So we give disproportionate importance to things which are less relevant. Domestic consumption of gold jewelry, we spend about what? 250 billion every 10 years. What is 250 billion? It's more than what FA has invested since they were allowed in India. Since FIs were allowed in India, for the last 30 years, all they have bought in is less than what you and me spend for 10 years in gold. What they have bought in is invested in, 90% of their money is in 60 stocks. And those 60 stocks are highly weighted in Nifty. Of course, if you take top 5 private banks, 3 banks, uh, more than 50% is owned by FIAs. And there they are probably HDFC, HDFC Bank is 18% of Nifty. But they are not 18% of India. Right? Domestic institutional funds are bigger than FIAs. You and me, our 10 years saving in a commodity which as simple as gold is more than what FA has invested since they were allowed. So uh, sometimes we glorify people more than what they deserve, right? FA don't deserve this much glorification. Uh, in one event, I, it sounded like an arrogant statement, but uh, I didn't mean that way. But in one event, I said uh, this is a group of majority of the participants with FA and said that was, if you want to leave, leave. We have limitation capacity. If you leave, there will be someone who will come and sit. More than you needing us, more than me needing you, you need us. If you leave India, where will you go? Show me one country which has a market like this. Right? So, FAs are important, but they are not the only drivers of market. They are drivers of maybe 10, 12 stocks, which in turn, are heavily weighted index. They are not even 10% of India's market cap actually. We sometimes link tax policies with growth. Actually in the reformist budget, corporate taxes were raised, not cut. In 1991, what was corporate tax? It was 40%. And people said it's low and we increased to 45. That brings to the question of what is our direct tax revenue? Corporate tax, personal income tax. And people say we are lower than Ethiopia, yeah? But how much we collected? About 11.2, 11.3 you know, total tax collection of government, 1991, 55,000 crores. That's all. Direct, indirect, excess duty, customs, we had 27 different taxes. Was 56,000 crores. Out of the direct taxes, there were hardly 9, 10, 12,000 crores. So, what is it now? 11 and a half lakh crores. Only direct taxes. I'm not counting direct taxes. So, while on a 2600, sorry, put trillion, 2.6 trillion economy, you had 170 billion tax collection. When our economy is one tenth this size, what was our tax collection? It's not that tax collection is deteriorated, it's improved dramatically. This is, see that improvement can come either from better compliance and actual income level. Let's say actual income level is growing. Better compliance, better compliance again is a function of uh, voluntary, also regulatory environment. We need to create an environment. For example, how many of us read the tax collection report? You read that last year. So they don't put names, but they give you ample idea. For example, if you take um, last year uh, numbers, 
um, the number of uh, fashion designers who pay tax is more than number of um, hospitals that pay tax. How do you judge this? There are 17,000 hospitals that pay corporate tax. There are 18,500 fashion designers who pay tax. Look at the tax compliance number last 2-3 years. If there is any indication, this number will catch up. Every 2% catch up is, is you will see in, in the context of our tax collection, the numbers will grow between 15-25% to 25 in actual number in the next 3-4 years. And that compliance is coming from, uh, see, people put GST, GST is important, critical, but where GST is playing out is not necessarily on the amount that in GST that you collect. For example, let's say till 2017-18, I am RGCC, I deal with some 175 different vendors who supply products to me. I don't care whether they are tax compliant or not because I need to pay excess duty on whatever cars I manufacture. Right? But now I have to pay GST, it's an input tax. So the consumption point, not at the point of manufacturing, which means I need to ensure that I deal with only those vendors who are tax compliant. They in turn has to deal with those people who are tax compliant. So, till 2017, the unorganized sector in India, which is 35% of our economy, were able to deal with other unorganized players in the industry, as well as organized players in the industry, giving somewhat tough competition to other organized players in the industry. But today, the unorganized sector is not able to deal with the organized industry. Right? That is why the stress levels there is more. Is that stress level good or bad? It's actually good for us. It may be bad for them. And you look at them, you feel bad for it. But that unorganized industry is not there in, say, established businesses. Usually what happens in India when a business opens up, you will find thousands of guys jumping into it. Few do it well. And industry tends to consolidate around them. And small, marginal, fragmented market, people will find it difficult. And scale of economics benefit comes to this guys. So after 10, 15 years, you will find, as you find today, Five banks control 71% of India's banking deposits. 76% of advances, 87% of the market cap. Five banks. Three automobile companies will be 80% of India auto sales. Two wheeler, three wheeler, four wheeler, that's it, anything. You look like 6,200 IT companies in India. Five IT companies control 54% of India's IT exports. Right? Maybe five oil companies, 95% of India. Three telecom companies, 80%. These are all mature businesses. But that's not the case with, say, anything to do with building materials. That's not the case anything to do with textile. That's not the case anything to do with sugar. The top five sugar manufacturers put together won't even be 5% of the industry. Fragmented. So those businesses, stress undergoing in the next 2, 3, 4, 5 years is actually a good thing in India for overall efficiency, right? And our growth is not going to slow down because of them. There is some other pocket, there is, there is growth happening. Which city of the following had more office space leased in 2018? On one side, you talk about slowdown in India. As I said, there are no signs of slowdown here. Do people take office space and do what with it? If they don't have anything work to do. Bangalore leased 15 million square feet last year and vacancy levels are still 3% only. What is 15 million square feet? I'll just put a number. Last year, this year, next year, these three years. What Hyderabad adds, Hyderabad is not even number one in India, okay? It's number two. What Hyderabad adds in office space last year, this year, next year? is what New York has added since September 11, 2001. Okay? If you take Bangalore last year, it's not just more than Shanghai, it's not just more than Beijing, it's not just more than London, it's not just more than Paris. It's more than Shanghai plus Beijing plus London plus Paris. What Bombay did last year is three and a half million. And what Bangalore will do between now and who is the biggest tenant? 
not technology companies. Actually, financial services first. Who is the second biggest tenant? Not technology. Pharmaceutical. Who is the big, third biggest tenant? Not technology again. Engineering. Because we get so obsessed with one brush, Bangalore. How many of us realize that 37 percent of offshore research in R&D, R &D in, in pharma, which is offshore, which means American pharma companies doing research in America or an European pharma company doing research in Europe, that's onshore R&D in pharma. You just take offshore R&D in pharma globally, little more than one third is India. And that's happening in Bangalore. Earlier, the trials, the human, human trials, all the drug delivery process is about three, four years, sometimes five years. When Abbott goes and buys 1,700 crores worth of office in BKC, and largest corporate deal in Bombay last year, it's not investment. It's not put to put uh, corporate staff. And when AstraZeneca puts 10,000 people in Bangalore, um, is is not uh, there is a lot behind some of these numbers which if you read you will see the activity level improvement uh, materially happening not just in one two sectors quite wide actually Bombay is world's number one in expect income the expect income in Bombay is more than it's more than Hong Kong. It's more than any other city in the world. Actually, when the survey was done, asking why did you choose a city? Why did you choose? You are an expat. You moved from your country to work in another country. Thirty-eight percent of the participants said the growth prospects. Here, the answer is very close to twenty-two out of the licensed companies have promoter stakes of 40-50% or above. Why it is important is the many things that works in global markets actually doesn't work here because India is one unique market where promoters are the dominant shareholding class. We are seventh largest market cap, sixth largest economy. Show me one market which is bigger than us where you have this kind of promoter high holding. There in shareholding is institutionalized. Executive management is professionals, which is why credit rating, which is why the way we evaluate their debt, if promoter gives a personal guarantee on the corporate debt, which is a standard norm 20 years back. Now we call this a related party transaction, right? So it will be obviously high, high grade because your debt to coverage ratio is very low. On an average, you take a, say a banking or insurance company is there. What was Lehman's debt to equity ratio when it collapsed? 31. 31 times leverage. We call 7 times leverage as very, very high. Our standard leverage is 3, 4 times when 8 is allowed number. Right? So obviously your credit quality in certain parameter terms will be far better than what it looks like for the market. There are many things. For example, of late you hear money funds like ESG fund, right? which is becoming a craze, ESG, there are rating methodologies and we spent more than a day, we even did a calendar, each year when we do a calendar, we take one subject and discuss 52 weeks, a different thing about say green, environment, governance standards, activism, all that. This year it was ESG when we did January 2019 and then we said if you put an Indian company in various about five rating companies of globally on ESG parameters, all the five guys will come with different ratings. This is a context, uh, we all read Keynes, right? He ran uh, this contest, uh, it's called Beauty Contest. Um, he did that in 1930s, 60s. One fine day, he advertised uh, one full page in London Times uh, with 100 photographs of pretty women aged between 20 and 30. Um, he said, uh, I'll give you two tickets to New York by first class, by a ship, and a weekend stay in Lewis World of uh, some kind of. 
and all you need to do is to you should pick six of this hundred pretty women whom you think majority will pick hmm? it's not about six prettiest women in your eyes you should pick six women whom you think others will pick and it became a challenge so similar to that mr richard taylor who recently got nobel prize last year he did this in 1998 he did this he announced in financial times one full page ad 0 to 100 you should pick a number which is two third of the number which majority has picked my question is clear right 20 30 40 3 guys average is 30 to the 20 who chose to... so this is actually each time i do i, I get uh, uh very thrilled how can someone numbers can come closer to a range i tell you what that range is so the reason he did this is uh, when you buy a stock you are buying hoping that others will buy right at some point later and you have some excel spreadsheet earnings growth and you when when you know that these things happen you believe that others will buy so you should be a little ahead which means you should be one step ahead of the majority that's all really is when everything is out in public and you act on it that's not a great thing that's why most time occasions stocks um don't do well when all the good news is already out right so you should buy one step ahead um since majority thinks they are one step ahead you should be one step ahead of that person correct so we call this as uh, level 1 thinking level 2 thinking level 3 thinking so if tomorrow let's say there is a rail budget and some norms are announced and the rail stocks go up what is it called level 1 thinking right if you are buying ahead of the crowd you are expecting some announcements to come and you know that when these announcements come others will buy and you are buying ahead of them so here he has uh, uh, the results are here you can't choose a number 100 right the question is simple it is two third of the number others choose if everyone has chosen 100 the winner has to be two third of that 100 which is 67 so no number cannot be or should not be higher than 67 there will be some people who will like to tilt the average if i know that if some of you know why we are doing this and your intention is you want to shift that average up only then you will put 100 also uh, we read about nash equilibrium right what is the point at which other possibilities don't exist which means if you keep doing two third two third two third if i think everyone is level one thinker then i should have chosen two third of 66 but if you say boss this is something like complicated mathematics uh, thing safe number is it should be average if it is 0 to 100 average is 50 hmm? and most people will choose 2/3 of 50 which is 33 you might have seen many number coming close to 33 right this is level one then you say since many people will think this way let me choose 2/3 of 33 and there will be few guys who will think since many people will think like that 
I'll use two thirds of that. And someone who is a PhD or econometrics will choose zero or one. Because he knows there's no end to this and it will eventually come to zero. And they fail in stock market. <laughs> the guys who succeed, if you look at the majority of the people who made money, they will be in level two if they are up against level one guys. The majority of the winners will be level three guys who are up against level two guys. So you need to know who, who, who is around you. Right? You can't play this game independent of that. Can you play this game independent of this? You, are, you have to choose two third of. So the average is what is coming across is 28.39. This is clear mathematical average of the majority answers. So where is this 28 coming is between um, level 2 of 100 and level 2 of 50. You are exactly in between. What you are saying is, since most people will choose 66, I will choose 2 thirds of 66 or you think most people will choose 33, I will choose 2 thirds of 33. Is how you ended up in that number. Right? That's how your mind actually, at least whoever who applied their mind for a minute to come realistic would have done that. So all you need to be is to be in level 3. That's all. If you know that majority is in level 2, if you had chosen 2 thirds of that 28, you would have been the winner. Someone came with 17, 16, 15. So Vichita has done this in hundreds of forums in, in different timelines between 1998 till 2015. And he even asked people to justify. There, there, sometimes what happens is there are three, four guys who have chosen the same number and he can't afford to give first class um, to and fro from London to New York to all the participants. So last time he did, he did in a few years back, he chose a guy from Goldman Sachs because he gave the uh, reason, uh, right reason why he chose that. And most occasions he has done, the right number is coming um, between 14 and 28. It depends on which crowd is doing this. All you need to do is two thirds of that crowd average. Which means if you have to be a successful investor, you have to be one step ahead of the rest, right? Which means, uh, for example, if you know that the average age of a home buyer is falling, which stock you should buy? Housing finance companies? That's level one thinking. Real estate companies? That's level two thinking. In 2002, only about uh, less than one third of the paints sold in India were branded. Last year, maybe a little more than 75% of the paints sold were five brands. During this period, the industry would have grown some single digit number. But 10 lakhs in 2002 in Asian paints is today uh, 16 crores. Price has grown 160 times. What is price? Price is equal to E earnings multiplied by multiple. E multiplied by P divided by E is P. So for share price to go up, either earnings has to go up or P has to go up. Out of this 160 times, how much you came from P? A 15, 20 P stock is today maybe 50, 60 P. So 3, 4 times has come from P. Balance 52 times has come from earnings. Earnings drive P, P doesn't drive earnings. Performance of the company drive perceptions. Perception doesn't drive performance of the company. If there are two variables that determine whether you are a good bad investor, one is a leading one, that leading one is earnings. 
If you don't have the skill set to evaluate the earning growth of the companies, don't be a stock picker. And your earning growth of the companies, you need to know where the driver is coming from, little one step ahead of the majority. Because if majority knows, it is obvious. Obvious is already reflected in the price. Today, I should not be going and buying Asian paints. If by this logic, there may be some other logic why you should buy or you shouldn't buy. I'm not suggesting to you that you should buy or you shouldn't buy. I'm just giving an indicator. If, if you know that soon two-third of India is going to be below 34 and a half of them are women and women in this age are not buying gold as much as they used to buy earlier and they are buying, they are more educated, they are more migrant, they are born in Delhi but working in Bombay. And in a new, new town, they don't have the local comfort with the jeweler they would have had in their native place. So, they prefer to buy from a branded jeweler. And you ask any jeweler, what is your largest cost item? It's inventory, because inventory cycle in jewelry business is three, three and a half years, three and a half months. So, a gold coin may take 21 days to sell, a higher necklace may take three, four, five months to sell. So, if you have to do a thousand crore turnover, you have to have 300, 400 crore working capital. But just take Titan 16,000 crores golden jewelry sales. What is their working capital? What is their inventory? Nothing. Why? They have leased gold. They have white balance sheet with which they can go and take gold on lease. And whenever they sell, they can buy gold from market to replenish the lease. So they don't have hedging costs and inventory costs. Which you, you and me can do as a jeweler, but we, we run our shop in cash or customers pay by cash. We run our establishment by cash. So we can't do this gold leasing. And even if you could have done that five years back, it was not possible. Why you go all that? You take our own industry. I will give you a live example. When I began my career in 91 in equities, Delhi used to have 400 brokers. Bombay used to have 850 brokers. Kolkata used to have 500 brokers. Chennai, I used to be one of the 169, 68, 166 brokers. There is no NSC, there is no SEBI, LIFERS, Hmm? Four of us used to go to stock exchange, the manual trading. We used to charge our clients two and a half percent. On the rate, we tell the client what we did. <laughs> Which the client has no clue about it. Right? So all brokers are happy. Then NSE came in, system came in, VSAT terminal, satellite technology. Motilal went and did 8,000 terminals. Kotec did 5,000 terminals, bringing transparency to the investor. But you must like that, but what was moving more it is scale of economics. What a job otherwise four guys being being done by four guys, eight thousand terminals are doing. And that resulted in the brokerage rate falling from two, one, half, point to one. Now we are as good as zero. Then SEBI came in. Till ninety nine we had no margin system. Ninety two, you had twenty one days time to pay money. You had no margin requirements. If your clients place a hundred close order, you can go and buy. Today you can't do. There are few broking companies who can do because they are well capitalized. And today, more than half of daily volume in market is being done by top 10 broking firms, which was not the case 10 years back or 20 years back. So, had you bought stocks of these guys, you would have made 10 times. Whether it is Motilal, Illuvis, IFM, take any name. What is the last 5 years shareholder return? 3x, 5x, 8x, 10x. Is that how brokerage industry has grown? No. Number of brokers have shrunk from 850 to 50 because of disruption coming from A technology, B regulation. Right? So when consumption level market comes in, when you have a tailwind as fast as it's happening, and your journey to 5 trillion is a question of either 8 years or 11 years, and the composition of that 5 trillion is not going to be the same, has never been the same in India. We tend to extrapolate it. Okay, what was, what was the largest market capitalized stock of India in 1999-2000 when we began this century? It's a stock we spoke, we, we discussed as a question in the previous, with this previous speaker, let me hear. You know the largest market capitalized stock of India? 1999-2000? No. This is a stock we spoke, you asked a question on Z. Z was the largest Indian company. Okay, what was the largest market cap stock of 1991? Tata Steel. Take Sensex in 91 when we were bought, less than half a trillion economy. 
steel, cement, power, textile. These four businesses was more than 50 percent of index. There is no HDFC bank because it was not even set up. State bank was not even IPO. Total financial services was three percent of index. Hmm? There is no IT company. There is no pharma. 2004, we reached one trillion economy from less than half. When we reached one trillion economy, what was the shareholder contribution from these four sectors, which was more than 50 percent of Sensex? Steel, cement, power, textile was zero. The shareholder, the weightage of those fell from 53 to below 20. Economy doubled, they didn't grow, they shrunk, and their weightage shrunk. What is shareholder return in army mills, let's say, between 94 and 2014? 20 years. Zero. Market grew seven times, eight times, but there are many dominant businesses which were dominant in one type of economy, did not grow. So 2004, when we reached 1 trillion, what was 50% of Sensex? IT, Pharma, Engineering. So what are they today? Two and a half trillion economy, less than 20 percent. What was financial services when we reached one trillion economy? Single digit, less than 10 percent. What is it today? 40 percent. So when we reach five trillion, will 40 percent of market be financial services? No way. Right? There are various elements of consumption which are extremely fragmented, where leaders are emerging one by one. That's what financial services was, right? There are 1,900 finance companies in, 19, in 1990 to 2001. 90% of them didn't survive post 2001. So you need a disruption for the shackling the industry, right? So, consumer goods industry, if you take, it's extremely fragmented, getting consolidated. And all we look at in index and big names are leaders in consolidated businesses. But that's not where the future value is. If you just keep your eyes open, ears open, and be you know, familiar, not oblivious to the happenings around you. And if you're an agile consumer and a good average investor, you don't need high intellect. You need 10, 20 percent intellect. Maybe eighty percent good temperament, right? If you have that, I when I whenever initially when I read the book in in when I began my career in ninety one, it's called Peter Lynch book, One Up on Wall Street, and most people said this kind of stuff don't work in India. Actually, it didn't work in India, right? It didn't work. I think time to work is now. Last three years, that book is working beautifully, right? Because we were not in consumer economy then. He wrote that in US based on US 70s, 80s. Which is, which is when he built his track record. Which is where we are getting into now. So you just look at, uh, uh, say, a cooker company or a footwear company. Or a... Yesterday I met a promoter, the CEO and chairman of the company. Um, he just runs some plywood lamination company. According to you, it's just like a plywood lamination. You know the shareholder return is created already in the last 15 years, 200x. He has created 200x in his own shareholder return by running a plywood lamination business because he is a beneficiary of that shift from unorganized to organized, fragmented, consolidated. So my only point to you is be familiar with those numbers and I'm sure you'll all become a great shareholder. Thank you. I lengthen my conversation so much uh, that I will not be harassed with questions. Thank you. So uh, there's no time for questions. That's what you wanted to come in? Oh my God. Had I known I would have continued for a little more time. Yeah, happy to uh, take questions. Yeah. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. What I wanted to know is that 
through these 25 questions or even more that you have uh, kind of asked in other presentations as well. Whatever you've gained through these facts about Indian economy, if you could summarize uh, your learnings or some trends that you see for future, which can help all of us as investors to invest in the right places, what would that summary be? Um, uh, there was no simple answer to it. Uh, one thing I know, I think, I think it is Mark Twain who said that uh, most of the troubles we get in our life uh, don't come from things we don't know. They all come from things we think we know. So if you know your limitations, be humble. Be conscious of your limitations and stay within what is called circle of competence. If you look around most successful investors, they didn't make more than 5 to 10 good decisions in their lifetime. So Buffett used to practice this as punch card system. Just assume that you take a card, punch 50, you know that these are all the decisions. Then you will behave carefully before you act on each thing. You will do homework. And the beauty of doing the homework is how much ever you do, you will always know that there is something else, something more I need. Which is what passion is, right? You will never feel that you achieved your own. So that, each one have their strengths. A medical professional is better placed to observe certain trends around him. As a consumer, you have better scope to observe the trends around you. Far ahead of the market and analyst in Bombay. Right? So, keep your uh, define your circle of competence. Keep expanding the circle. Learn, but don't step out of the circle. Never, uh, never get envied with someone else's um, uh, trade, because his circle of competence may be different. Buffett's portfolio is public uh, for the last forty years. How many people have bought like him, held like him, sold like him? I have been holding his stock now for about 14 years, 15 years. Best thing I did is I never sold. I bought the stock and forgot my password. My brokerage trade account the last 10 years in US is zero, zero trade. But 2008, when no one was buying, was a period when uh, I must have bought more or less whatever cash I had. So, to give an online, define your circle of account. And stay within it, try to expand that circle of competence, but don't step out of it. And if that means you can buy two stocks in one sector, so be it. If that means 15 stocks in three sectors, great. If that means 40 stocks in 10 sectors, that's also great. But that's a function of you as an individual. If, you're a, if you want to do stock picking yourself, that's how you should approach. Just to comment, sir, uh, thank you for this presentation. It was wonderful. Any plans of putting this up on uh, TED Talk or having that so that we can have regular access to it? Okay. TED Talk? Yes. Uh, no, yeah. uh, already my questions are out. So if it comes on YouTube, people will access YouTube next time when I make the presentation. So which is why I often change the questions. It's not that there's any um, price sensitive information or confidentiality. You just need the right perspective. Uh, uh, some of the trends in Tanishq is known uh, to you as a consumer than anyone else know 10, 15 years back. Today, if you are in wealth management industry, you are seeing a trend which uh, is evident. For example, uh, I, I delivered a lecture in a federation of some, some advisory forum and I started my presentation from slide 2. Um, these are all financial advisors um, and while nearing conclusion people asked certain kind of questions which were little they were abusing SEBI, they were abusing banks, mis-selling, wealth managers uh, as if that these people, I mean other advisors are noble in what they are doing 
And uh, so I said that there is a specific reason why I skipped the slide one. Now I will go back to the slide one. I went to the slide one, which was titled How to Write Your Obituary. That's the title of the presentation. Today, if you take our, um, our fund management industry, say mutual funds, 8 lakh crores equity, 23 lakh crores total AVM, 18% of this AVM is from top 10 wealth managers. About 10 years back, Equity AVM was about 3 lakh crores, total AVM of mutual fund industry was below 10 lakh crores and only 11% of the total AVM was with these 10 wealth managers. 20 years back, equity AVM was about 20,000 crores and total AVM of mutual fund industry was less than 1 lakh crores and of these 10 wealth managers didn't even exist in wealth management. So what is the trend? 10 years from now, when you find 8 lakh crores mutual fund AUM becoming 20, 20 lakh crores and total 23 lakh mutual fund AUM becoming 50, 60 lakh crores which is what they aspire to grow, maybe 30, 40 percent of the industry will be with top 10 wealth managers. You had 4 lakh mutual fund agents 10 years back when the industry was one third current size, industry has grown 3 times, number of AR and holders 83,000. When the industry grows Next, you won't find more than 10,000 guys in the industry. Like broking, it happened. So, if, if you are in industry and you are seeing how do you link, when you should have bought a Motilal, you should have bought IFL, IFL will, okay, it's a record going on. So, these are all great ideas. You see, I'm not saying that you should buy now or you should have bought based on one day's trade. These are all triggers of that. So, uh, each one's comfort level comes. There is no one thing. One, one reason why we, uh, you won't find us in any media or, or public presentation is um, many of these ideas when, 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 when facts change, we change our opinions and we don't feel shame or bad about it. But when you go on media press or go official about it, uh, somewhere inside your mind you get better to it and even when facts change, you find it hard to change. And uh, those are some of the reasons we may try to, that's why we do this calendar kind of stuff, where we, we state, if you are interested I will have few copies sent across. Most of this we captured two and a half years back, saying that boss, is this a time to be bearish? How can you be bearish? The whole India is moving so fast, look at Bangalore, look at Hyderabad, look at the middle class, look at the consumption, wherever you go you see the consumption driving. Just take a paper and pencil, right, what is your GDP? 2.6? What is it next year? Say 2.93. What is it? Write it for the next 8 years. Add all this. Write it for the last 70 years. Add all this. What do you make next 8 years more than what you made last 70 years? You may say high base all that. But fact is, next 8 years corporate earnings will be more than last 70 years. Then where is the need to be bearish? Is it time to be extremely bullish? You should not be bullish in where action has already happened over. There are so many other areas where it's happening where we have an advantage, institutions don't have. See, institutions need larger ideas. India is a country with 1,650 stocks in NSC, 4,000 stocks in BSC, 2.7 trillion market cap, but two-third of our market cap is nifty 50 companies. And the next 50 companies are another 20%. 80% of investable universe of India is 100 companies. You will find that in the FIS, which is why 90% of the FA money is in 60 stocks. But what about mutual funds? 41 asset management companies, 127 fund managers, 274 different schemes. Take all the stocks they own, put it in one single Excel sheet. If you are the only mutual fund investor in India, how will your portfolio look like? 45% of your money in 10 stocks, 70% of your money in 43 stocks, probably 90% of your money in 100 stocks. So, why play that game? You, you have no advantage. They can't play this game because they need size. If I'm a 5,000 crore fund manager, how many stocks do I invest in? 20, 30, 40 stocks, right? So each stock you should buy at least 100, 200, 300 crores. How many companies are there? Tomorrow you call your broker. Tell him I'm planning to buy 100 crores in a stock like that in 20, 30 companies. Give me the list of companies from which I can pick my 20, 30 stocks. You won't send a list more than 70 names. But if your ticket size per stock is uh, 50 lakhs, 1 crore, 10 crore, what do you consider as liquid is illiquid for them. That's a beautiful place to be. Thank you.
we will take one last question. Uh, thank you, sir, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, I was uh, so you uh, you mentioned tax collection report in your uh, talk, uh, and apart from the newspapers, which I don't think you may have very high opinion about. Which one? Uh, Apart from the popular media and newspapers, which I don't think you may have that high opinion of, so what else do you recommend as suggested reading list for any uh, for so upcoming uh, and aspiring investors in our midst? See, there's no one place uh, uh, or one journal or one magazine or one place. So we should cultivate the habit of uh, what Charlie Munger calls as multifaceted thinking, right? Uh, there are various biases, various uh, things we have. We think best ideas will come when we read economic times. Usually don't. So if, when you read a few things, it will, it will jump to conclusion and you should start asking why. When you ask why, then you will need some data points. And you need to seek. And it won't be readily available. So we tend to give a lot of importance to something which is readily available. And what is readily available may not be the right one to refer to, to judge. So, if you come to Chennai in our office, you will find all kinds of books. You will find uh, sociology, uh, you will find uh, social studies, you will find books written in Pune, where I made the same presentation I made last weekend. Uh, we have something called Library of Mistakes. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. This is called Library of Mistakes. We have some 6, 7,000 books. Why should you commit a mistake to learn from it? Why don't you learn from someone else's mistakes? All the books in that will be um, concerning what kind of aberrations, mistakes, misinterpretations, disasters that have happened in the last 200, 300, 400 years on financial markets, commodities, those kind of stuff. So when you broaden your scope, it helps a lot in taking... See, one is data point. Sometimes there is no depth of it or rather there is more of it. But you need uh, to link that correctly. So how do you link um, demography of declining population age? So you should ask the question, you know, if the average age of the home buyer in 2002 was 51, can you believe it? Which has fallen to 34 last year. So you should be saying, okay, 51 year old, 2001 should have been bought in 1949. He became an adult in 1972 when Hema Malini was the matinee idol. And he must have worked 30 years to save enough money to buy a house. And there were seven housing finance companies in 2001. Stringent on the credit they extended only to buy the house, not doing at doing the house. So where will you put? You will put all the money in just meeting that obligation of buying the house at the age of 51. That's India. But even you know that the average age of a home buyer in India 2018 was 34. Who is this guy who is 34? Born in 1982. Became adult in 2003. Within 3, 4, 5 years, he was able to save enough money to buy a house. And today, we have 141 housing finance companies. Liberal than giving you credit, extended time period, not only in buying the house, but in also doing at the house. Right? So, a part of what budget he allocates is going and doing at the house. And paint is the cheapest line item in doing at the house. So he is more urbanized and is more young. Aesthetic value in life, brand tilt curtains. So what is the drivers of the shift? If you can think, those, those things, you know, book will teach you. You just need to practice the way. The best place to read is companies' reports, you know, management discussion. One will lead to the other. If you have an open mind and time permitting, these things don't actually take too much of time. It actually takes limited time. We sometimes spend 70-80% of our time in addressing tomorrow's issues, next quarter performance, next quarter earnings, and uh, get obsessed with benchmarking, beta, outperformance, all this. This is all useless stuff. So if you take top 10 investors in India, look at their wealth. 80% of their wealth would have, moved, would have happened in 10 ideas, right? Or less than 10 ideas. Thank you, Mr. Maran. I would request Kulpreet Sodi to deliver a thank you note. On behalf of CFS Society India, 
I'd like to extend a vote of thanks to Mr. Maran for taking time out on this Saturday morning and sharing valuable insight with us. Thank you so much. And it was a pleasure having you here. And I really appreciate your skill of adding numbers to every other sentence that you speak. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so you very much. much.